keyboard warriors, get your fingers warmed up. Joel is a licensed elk killer. <laughs> Let me explain. There's a place in Washington where Joel voluntarily goes to help them manage their elk population. For example, in 2022, he killed 19 elk for this location and he butchered every one of them. And he's been doing that for how long? 23 years. Is it safe to say you've had hundreds of elk in front of you that you've butchered? Yes. Okay, and I've butchered an animal with him one time. Dude, you're really good at butchering. <laughs> yeah. Seriously, like you're pro. So I kind of want to talk to you guys today with kind of Joel's angle of a subject matter expert on where to shoot an elk, where not to shoot an elk, and what to do. And we're gonna do this the Cliff Notes version. So when you're looking at the hump of this elk, this is the top of the scapula, right? So it's a big plate that comes down is a big triangle here and it comes down all the way down to this knuckle this is the humerus bone so those two come together and the humerus follows this right here so you have this giant triangle and you're trying to put your arrow in the triangle or slightly behind the crease a lot of people try to get you know they shoot like three or four inches behind the crease if they've got a low penetration system but you're starting to deal with liver and guts and all kinds of stuff when you get too far back so i keep my arrows on elk fairly tight to the crease Whereas on deer, I'm not afraid to come straight up the leg and go right through those shoulders. But on an elk, you gotta be really careful to stay away from that scapula unless you're shooting a, a pretty high energy system. Your lungs come back probably about eight inches, uh, six inches behind the shoulder, behind this crease, somewhere in there. If you get behind that, you're starting to deal with lots of guts and such. And also you gotta be careful to angle your arrow. So you're looking at this triangle here, try to stay away from this humerus bone. It's a big, heavy bone and the scapula. If you're coming into the scapula in here, the lungs do sit behind the scapula on an elk, but you know, up here in the upper plate, it's not that difficult to get through. But as you get lower, that scapula gets thicker when it comes into the humerus. So you're trying to stay in here, halfway up the body is good if you get too low. You know, when you're starting into an elk down here, you got about six inches of nothing but breastplate. If you do hit them below that line in the brisket, they're gonna act funny. They're gonna act real sick and you're gonna get really some false hope. Yeah. And the truth is, is if you don't get another arrow in them, you're not gonna recover it. And you might even get some decent blood. And a lot of times it seems like it messes with their blood pressure where they just feel like they I gotta dizzy. hold, they get dizzy. Yep. And you're like, oh, I got them. You yep. got to get another arrow in them. When you're talking about up here in what they call no man's land, there's actually no pleural space. There's no space between the top of the lungs and the spine. That space is always filled up, especially when the lungs are inflated. And the spine's not right here, yeah, it's per se. Well down into when you have the spinal process, those vertebrae that come up in here. So if you do hit an elk on this, you know, down into here, you may think that you got high lungs and on your blood trail, you're gonna see lung blood because you did hit them in the lungs, but it's not low enough in the lungs to actually collapse the lung. So you get about 300 yards of decent blood and it is low lung blood and then if it just stops all of a sudden it's probably a no man's land hit so that elk is it's a non-fatal hit usually on that elk so come down into it just slightly get another inch lower then you're going to get lung blunt that doesn't stop if your bleeding stops that means that you did not hit the organ that you thought you hit like lungs don't stop bleeding hearts don't stop bleeding and livers don't stop bleeding those blood trails are heavy all the way to the critter it just depends on how far and how long they go depending on what organ you've hit let's talk about the diaphragm where that ends and where the guts begin so it's right at the back of the lungs is the diaphragm because again those lungs are pushing up against the diaphragm and so it's right back in here and right on the other side of that is liver and the liver sits at somewhat of an angle to those guts and everything gets pushed up by the guts depending on how much how much stuff they have in their guts and how much they've been eating so it all gets pushed up so you've got this really thin band of liver and diaphragm in here and then past that is nothing but guts and this liver hit does happen. It could come on an angle shot. And if you do connect with it, you, you can be confident, but you have to be cautious. It's not like they're gonna tip over in the next 60 seconds. Right. And then the color of blood is really, it's gonna be milky dark. Yeah, it's kinda... Anything back in here is problems because you know there's just no guarantee you're gonna recover that animal or guarantee it's gonna hold still. And people asked us today at camp, like if we do make this poor shot, how much time do we give them? And, and I don't know what you said, but I remember telling them, you just got to leave the crime scene completely and come back the next day right would you agree with that yeah, absolutely you these bulls will usually bed down within two three hundred yards 
and they always bed down, they're watching their back trail, they've got the wind in their face, there's really very difficult ways to get on them again, and then when you bump them, they're going. And when they go, when they decide that they get spooked on something, it is usually a half mile at least. And you're not gonna have a lot of blood to go on, so it's, it becomes a very daunting task. So let them sit for as long as you possibly can, depending on how hot it is, uh, you know, what your predator population is around there. If you wanna recover that elk, you gotta give them a lot of time. So I'll just go through some of my shots last year. So I shot a bull in New Mexico with the iron wheel, pretty much broadside, lower left lung lobe, passed through, went 15 yards. He definitely didn't have to shoot him again, but he's standing, I'm mm -hmm. shooting. Mm -hmm. Second shot was like right, kind of at an uphill angle. So it was kind of, arrow was kind of going up through the scap, out through butter. He folded in six yards from there. Uh, I shot an Idaho bull through the heart, literally where the color changes, nice and tight right there, right through the top of the heart. And I was surprised, right? Cause I thought maybe I hit the bottom of the heart or the middle, but it was the top of the heart, mm -hmm. but it was a steep downhill shot. And then the third bull I shot was with a Grim Reaper quartering two at 20 and I did go I like to go behind the shoulder and it was, I was higher ground, so it's coming down. That angle of your shot and where you're standing plays a huge role. And it went through the scap, through the liver, out guts, complete pass through. Did you get both lungs? Uh, no. So if you get a combo of lung and liver, then you're gonna have short, bl bl short blood trails, right? There. He died in sight. If you get only one lung, that bull can live for a long time on one lung. So be very careful with that. Uh, Bodie's bull last year, he shot, First shot at about 12 yards was right here, and the next shot was right here. So he, uh, at 30 was four inches apart, but Bodie knows the deal of if they're standing there and you get a shot. So two shots here and here, that bull went about 40 yards total. And then I called the bull in for Seth and he shot that at 12 feet. The bull was slightly quartered towards him and not realizing it at 12 feet, he shot it behind the shoulder. So he went, yeah. it still hit like three inches behind the shoulder, quartered towards him. So it was a one lung, liver and guts. We watched the bull walk around the corner, look pretty sick. And then once we did that, he was, I mean, he was literally right around the corner dead. Quartering away shots, a lot of times you gotta go through their haymaker. What I call it is like, you gotta go through their stomach. Depending on how steep of an angle, I always key in on the opposite, the opposite leg as my reference point, And I'm gonna try to kind of go right through that or just slightly behind it. So depending on the angle, you may have to go in through the hay, like grass, chewed up grass in the gut, then liver, then lung. But you're gonna wanna key on, not where your arrow's going in, but you're gonna aim for your exit is generally speaking on that quartering away shot. Um, I like slightly quartering away and I like the Joel Turner yo, which is something that I, you know, you introduced to me a few years back. Let's explain that. So when an elk comes in, a lot of times when you're calling a bull in, especially if you call him in with like the bull calling cow's bugle, he's coming all the way to you. He's looking to kill you. So he's gonna come in pretty close and you just stay in it. Like don't try to draw if he's looking at you and the bull may be five, eight, 10, whatever yards. And I just keep my face behind my limb and I, I read the bull's body language and when the bull he'll stop because he sees you and then when he realizes that you're not supposed to be there you'll see his body language change he'll his head will come slightly up he'll open his eyes up the ears may come forward he has seen you and he's made a decision on what he's going to do so you just stay in it the bull's going to whirl you let him whirl all the way until you see the nub of his tail because these things have 270 degrees of vision, so you wait till the tail is facing you, and once that tail is facing you, that's when you draw back. And when you draw back, you give them the yo. You hit them with a bark. Don't try to do it with a call, because you're gonna have cotton mouth and all kinds of craziness going on. Just give them the yo. And the cool thing about bull elk is, especially in the rut, their neck's all puffed up, and they can't necessarily turn their head and look over their rear end like a cow can. So that bull, when he turns, he'll have to turn his body. So don't try to shoot him on the spin. Let him spin till you see the tail, and then you draw your bow back when you're in that, that blind vision of them, and then you give them the yo, and that's when they turn and they're quartered away and you get that good shot that Dan was just describing. Um, there's a couple shots here. I'm just gonna say my opinion. Remember, it's just my opinion. You can sneak arrows in front of the shoulder and you can take that frontal as well. Um, I'm five for six on frontals and I don't really condone them unless I have an asterisk. I, and this is what I tell people at camp. I feel like you shouldn't take that shot until you've killed an elk with a broadside shot or whatever shot, like a good high probability, high odds multiplier shot. You've had the animal on the ground. You've peeled all the skin back. You've taken the shoulder off. You've looked at where the rib cage is, where the sternum is, and you start to really understand how elusive that softball size target can be. 
On the other side, I do understand like the solo calling in and the shot and how deadly it is and how you can really just draw a line where Joel told you to aim all the way in the front and you can see that that's gonna get into the good stuff. But a lot of times an elk will look like it's directly straight on from you, but maybe his butt sticking out one way or the other, or maybe it's slightly uphill, maybe it's slightly downhill. And that softball size really can shrink depending on how the animal's facing you. So I think you could pass this shot and do the yo so that if you're, ah, you're at full draw, he's looking and you're tempted to take that frontal, they get spooked, they start to turn, you give them the yo. Your 10 yard frontal now is a 15 or 18 yard cornering away and then also this shot to low odds unless you have something pretty fierce like maybe an iron wheel or something that's just going to get you that penetration it's a it's it requires high energy and at the end of the day it's way more exciting to recover an elk and it's detrimental to everyone's morale in camp to go not find an elk